we went to Texas A&M and said we want to do a study where we put the multiman into a cow before calving. We will allow her to calve out and then we're going to put another multiman injection in 30 days before we start the breeding season. And what we wanted to see was to monitor how we change the mineral profile in those animals. So basically what you can see by putting the mineral, the multiman in here pre-calving, uh, we actually delay that hit that they take. And the nice thing about that pre-calving injection is that you're actually treating two animals for the price of one. You're actually going to supplement that calf in utero. That calf in utero is going to get some of this mineral. Now, once that cow calves out, there's no way we can stop that drop that she's going to take because that package is just removed from her when she gives birth to that calf. However, you can already see a difference here is that the rate of drop in a cow that was supplemented pre-calving is much slower than it was in a cow that did not get anything pre-calving except oral exposure. And then if we can get to those cows in that window 30 days prior to breeding and we inject them there, we change this trend dramatically. You can see there's a much quicker response to elevate levels in the injected group than there is in the orally fed group only. And this difference that we create here is something which we research more and more to find out what the economic benefit of that is. Because if we can create an animal that has a better mineral status, how does that drive reproduction and how does that change some of the reproductive uh, parameters? So we actually took that same protocol and we went to Kansas State University and we asked them to please do a big herd study. So they included two different separate locations, one at Hayes, one in Manhattan. They included 460 cows in the study. And basically what we wanted to see is if we do a pre-calving and a pre-breeding injection, what are the benefits that we're going to get? Now basically the nuts and bolts, we improved calving percentage and I'll show you some data on that. We improved fixed time AI pregnancy because they also contribute uh, or continuously try and improve their genetic uh, value of those calves. So they do use a bunch of uh, AI to actually drive genetic improvement. We also compressed the calving season so we had more calves born earlier in the calving season and the cows treated with multiman lost less body condition score uh, between calving and breeding. So if we look at the pre-grade data, this was the original Texas A&M study. Uh, you can see that we moved uh, pre-grades from animals that were in the control group to the multiman group. It moved from 81% to 94 uh, in both of these studies, these cows were on a full oral mineral uh, supplement for the full duration of the study. So we did not take any mineral away. You can see the cows in Manhattan and Hayes was managed really well. We had almost a 90% preg rate in the control group. But yet again, we added three calves per 100 cows in there. So there's a bunch of money in there that's going to pay for your product. So this is how you pay for the product is uh, we're going to give you three more calves in 100 and that's going to pay uh, for spending the money on that product. Now, as I said, they make use of a fixed time AI program. We put the multiman in there 30 days before they started their breeding season, but they run a short five day seeder program to synchronize these cows. Then they will do fixed time AI. They'll leave them uh, for about a month and then they will do a uh, ultrasound scan and then they will put clean bulls in and then they will do another uh, prick check 35 days after the end of the breeding season to differentiate between AI calves and bull, ca uh, bull bred uh, calves. And basically, if we look at the, the benefit that they got from uh, the prick rates from the control group to, AI, to fixed time AI was 51.2% and we pushed that up to 60.2%. So we had nine calves out of 100 more born out of AI than bull bred. So we all have nine higher genetic calves more per hundred cows to sell uh, in, this, in, in this program. If we look at the calving distribution, uh, we also saw a benefit there. So you'll see that 65% of calves were born in that first 21, 20 day window in the control group and we moved that 65 up to 77%. So there's about 12 more calves that were born in that first 20 day window. So basically, if you look at it, we just cut the, the number in the second uh, 20 days by half. We just moved it from 31 to 19 and we just bumped that on top of that. 
Now, very often people say, okay, so what, what's this worth? What, what does it mean to get more calves uh, born in that first 20 days? And there's a very nice paper uh, came out last year, which Rick Funston published out of the uh, University of Nebraska, where they looked at what is the benefit of having more calves born in that first 20-day window. So if we review the, the heifer pro, uh, progeny, if we look at the heifers born in that first 20-day cycle, uh, basically what you're going to see is by the time they are old enough to be bred, you'll see that they, the, the heifers that were born in that first 20 days are going to have the highest preg rate. And it's a very simple thing to explain because if they were born earlier, they're going to wean heavier, they're going to reach puberty earlier, and they're going to be more reproductively efficient. So if ever you have to get rid of some of your replacement heifers, don't sell the ones that were born in that first 20 day window, sell the other ones. These ones you need to keep. If we look at uh, the amount of them then calving in the first 21 days, again, there's a big difference. We had 81% of them calve in the first 20 days and their cohorts much, much less producing calves in that first 21 day window. Another important thing is if we look at the number of them that had to be assisted with calving, it is the lowest quantity. So you're actually going to have a group of heifers that are going to be easier calving than if you keep all these other ones. And then the biggest risk that we always have when we breed these animals is that when that heifer needs to be bred the second time, that's our biggest, biggest challenge. And again, you can see that they are the most efficient breeding uh, after that first uh, calf that they, they dropped. If we look at the steers that are born in that first 21 day, 20 day window, uh, you can see that if we feed them out, those steers are going to be the ones with the heaviest carcass. They're also the ones that are going to have the best marbling score. And if we look at the carcass value between those different groups, the steer is going to be just over 60 bucks worth more than one born in the last part of that breeding season. So there's a bunch of money to be made out of really trying to push and, and, and compress that calving season. Just an interesting thing, uh, th this is a, a more recent study where they actually looked at longevity of female animals. And basically what we looked at, the percent of heifers that remained in a herd over time uh, with regards to which part of the breeding season they were born in. And you can see the blue line is the heifers that uh, were born in that first breeding cycle you will always have a bigger portion of them stay in your herd compared to the others. So it's actually uh, another tool to reduce the pressure on you to drive and get more, uh, more and more replacement heifers. So not only are you going to have a more reproductively efficient animal, you're also going to have an animal that's going to stay in the herd a little bit longer. So when do we use Multiman uh, in a cow-calf operation? Basically, we will employ one injection at preg check. Uh, that was exactly how it was done in the uh, Kansas State study when they did the uh, preg check 180 days prior to calving. They gave the product there. Uh, the Texas A&M study was done 30 days prior to calving, so we have data to show that it's safe whether you give it far away from calving or close to calving. The data exists to give you that flexibility. The big thing that I like about doing this is if you're going to sell open cows, you don't have to treat them, you save that money. So you don't treat an open cow if you follow this, pro this protocol, you will sell them without treating them. Then we will come in with a second injection, a minimum of 30 days prior to the onset of breeding in both cows and heifers. So we try and back it out 30 days or more prior to the onset of our breeding season. And then if we look at bulls, Bulls are a little bit different because the semen that a bull will utilize when you put him with the cows was actually produced 65 days earlier. So we need to get into the bulls a little bit ahead of time and we need to get into the bulls about 70 to 90 days prior to uh, turning them out to the cows. I just want to make a couple of points uh, discussing what happens to this calf uh, from birth up to the point where we have a calf that we're going to wean and either sell or retain. And Jay Branham did a really nice study at Texas A&M where he serial biopsied these calves from birth right up to weaning. And I want to make two or three comments here. The first thing is if we look at these calves at birth, they have really high levels of trace mineral and that is normal. People should not be uh, scared when they get uh, results back and these calves are really high at birth. They need to be high because they got to run off that for an extended period of time. 
Now the problem is that uh, once they start growing and they start living and they start eating, uh, they burn through about 75% of the trace mineral that they were born with within the first two months of age. So the first area where we're going to start seeing problems with the immune system is in this rapidly growing calf. If this calf was born with a level right there, it's going to be completely deficient by this time. So even before that day 56, we'll start seeing scours or respiratory disease. Now, unfortunately, this trend remains approaching weaning. It stabilizes out a little bit, but they, it's not increasing. So very often around weaning is when we start employing a bunch of vaccines. And very often we have a lot of these pre-vac or preconditioning programs that do not really work well. And one of the reasons why animals do not respond that well to these uh, pre-vac programs is because we have an immuno-incompetent animal. We have a bunch of really good uh, trace uh, vaccine that we're going to put into this animal, but it's going to be mineral deficient. So it will not respond that well to the vaccine. So typically, when we look at opportunities to do something to the calf, the product is labeled to be used at day old. So we can actually, if we have a bunch of cows that we, that we, we bought them out of a drought area and we know that they were scruffy and people didn't pay attention to them or didn't look after them, Yes, we can fix up that calf at day old. We can contribute to trace mineral status and give it to it immediately after birth. However, if that is uh, not required, if the cows were taken care of really well, we have an opportunity at branding. If we're going to handle those calves at branding, this is really when we have a low spot and we need to see if we can't contribute to these calves. And then obviously, when we approach weaning and we're going to employ some uh, vaccination protocols, it would be good to pay attention to the mineral status of those calves round right about weaning.